Hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show, The Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good buddy and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Assistant Chief Terry McGrath from the Louisville, Texas Fire Department. And we've got another great show and topic for you today. Uh, before we get started, a couple of uh, quick little shouts um, uh, on a... Uh, uh, kind of a sad note, uh, Ringgold, uh, Texas, uh, which is kind of north of the Metroplex, uh, east of Wichita Falls, uh, the volunteer fire department had a line of duty death, uh, the firefighters responding to, uh, uh, some wildland stuff that was getting to some structures. And, um, I think there was a rollover and all that that happened this morning, their own crews responded and then found them. So thoughts and prayers to the Ringgold, Texas, uh, uh, volunteer fire department, uh, again, a uh, very, very sad day for them. On a, uh, on a positive note, a friend of all of us on this panel, uh, Curtis Burt, uh, <laughs> started yesterday, right, Scott? Yesterday, uh, his new job is the training chief in Pearland, Texas, and every one of us has been down there. I know I've taught tons of programs. Pearland's one of those departments that is just a progressive group of men and women, great fire, growing area. I am. I don't know who I'm more excited for. If I'm more excited for them or for Curtis, because they're they're about to. Oh, just good luck, congr- Curtis. Great. Oh, congratulations, Curtis. Curtis is one of the, the first instructor, first guy before we even went with the program outside of the department to do saving her own back in Illinois. I can't wait to see what he does. A longtime author and instructor for Bobby Halton with FDIC and fire <laughs> engineering, and just a great guy. So, but hey, as a reminder to our, our viewers, um, as always. If you have any questions, head over to Twitter, send them our way. Just make sure you ha- add hashtag FE talk and uh, we'll do what we can to get as many of those as possible. Um, today, our topic is uh, two in, two out. Are you really doing it at your structure fires or just checking the boxes? And a little quick background. This just came up. Uh, actually, uh, we were just having a conversation today. I was uh, uh, with a particular department and uh during lunchtime, they're, you know, pretty big Metro department, couple thousand people, 58 stations. So there's no guessing there, Scott. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so no, great fight. Dallas, we're in Dallas and uh, great people. Great. I was there for the union, another great local 58. What a great group there, man. They are making so many great leaps when it comes to cancer and, and cancer and fighting for, for members that have it and, you know, all that workers comp stuff and so on and so forth. But we had a conversation about, you know, it, you get kind of lulled to sleep sometimes when you've got everyone coming behind you uh, selfishly. And I, everybody on this panel, Bobby Halton, you know, all the way up through every rank up to like number two, pretty much in Albuquerque, New Mexico, as assistant chief of operations, you know, then chief at Capel, um, you know, John Salka, all those years in the, you know, New York City, in the Bronx, battalion commander, and currently the chief of South Bloomingdale uh, Volunteer Fire Department of New York, Scott Thompson, the chief of the colony. We worked together for a long time, another longtime author and um, author of the best-selling book, The Functional Fire Company. There's a quick <laughs> shot. Best-selling book, baby. <laughs> hey, hey, thank you. Thank you. Another another Clarion Penwell uh, Fire Engineering Books product uh, that's selling good. You know, and, and Terry McGrath from, from, from Louisville, again, every one of us um, uh, gets, we get used to, you know, running with a lot of people and you know what happens when you run out of town and maybe they've got a single station or a couple and so the the question the topic came up about two in two out and writ and everything else so so forth so terry and i just thought let's just talk about are we doing it what we're doing it uh the concept uh basically hell just what are you doing to bring enough people to the scene to make sure you have enough people and before we started folks uh my, my my best buddy john salco brought up a point. The very first article I did for fire engineering in 1995 was an article called rapid intervention. It's mostly attitude. And one of the things not to get going too much on the rich side of this, one of the things I brought up was, you know, having early in my life, in fact, that's how I got into teaching was doing a lot of hazmat stuff in the Southwest suburbs of Chicago, Bedford park, big, big hazmat. And, you know, when we started dealing with the OSHA respiratory standard, they talked about two and two out and like structural stuff was an afterthought. So, well, should we have two guys, gals outside if there's two firefighters inside, so on and so forth? And then, you know, how it is in a fire service, it just blew up and everybody started going different directions. But in my article I wrote, I said, you know, why is it so difficult? John brought this up before on the air. Why is it so difficult? You know, you, you wouldn't put a diver, you know, Terry, you, we've had a dive team ever since you've been in Louisville, 50 something divers. 
we don't put a diver in the water without a safety diver. We don't put somebody up on the side of a hotel uh, or office building for a window washer pick or a hotel or a water tower without someone on belay. Um, us hazmat geeks would never send someone in level A suits. John, you brought this up beforehand and to mitigate it without having a backup team. So why is it so hard to have a couple people outside in case something goes wrong? And then you get all the, you know, I, I, I kind of go sometimes to those. I, I There's a saying I use that I want to start this off with what before those up on the hill throw stones down at the village, know what, you're, what the hell you're talking about. And actually maybe have you fought a fire or two when it comes to that, because you get this whole, well, two people could never get, you know, a guy, nobody's, nobody ever said, I've never said that in my life. John, you've been teaching written Mayday. That's how we met back in like 1990, 1991, you know, no one ever said you, you can, but we've talked about the fact that, you know, and, and let's move to NFPA 1710 or move to NFPA 1500 with the initial rapid intervention crew versus initial, you know, the rapid intervention team the, you know, that two people may not be able to get inside and drag somebody already down the carpet, down the stairs, so on and so forth, but they can initiate the rescue. They can locate the victim. They can throw a ladder to someone on the outside. They can open up a window, take some, there's so many things that initial team could do, but nobody ever said two people, it can happen, but two people were going to, you know, and, and the, the, the majority of the fire departments and I mean, Canada and the U S you know, are not running like, and John, I'll pick on you, the FDNY, you know, with, you know, with, with 2,200 guys on duty a day, a lot of them are, are working their ass off to just put some companies together to even start the initial fire attack, let alone have a RIT team there or two and two out. So there's the lead in guys. Um, and I, I guess the topic is, you know, are you making it work and, or just checking the boxes, John, I want to throw it to you first, your thoughts on two and two out and, if you want to talk written, all that stuff too, because I know, right, you've always said, and I agree, and Bobby does, and so Scott and Terry, there's a difference between the two. Don't confuse two and two out with an actual rapid dimension team per se, but go ahead, buddy. Right. And, and, and we've been talking about that. I mean, I don't know if you want, you want and all, all the guys here on the panel have been talking about that. I mean, there's so many perspectives on writ and two and two out. And I, I want to address your first point. You know, two and two out is really sort of a bridge between. The fire department arriving at the scene and when we're underway and we have an actual RIT team in place with the tools and, 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 you know, doing a size up and everything else, it's sort of a bridge in between. It's just to get something started. And if you can get that started, if you can get those two people identified and standing by or doing work out in the front, but available, immediately available to go in, then as the scene builds, as more alarms or more apparatus respond or more people respond, then you can start to build that team. And some people do take those first two and build on them. Others like the FDNY don't. We have two people standing by, like one off the first engine, one off the second engine. And when the third truck gets there, boom, they cut loose and they go back to doing what they're doing. And then we have a whole truck. Others have a two person team. And then when the third engine gets there, those two or three people join them. And now they have their five person RIT team. So I like to think of the two in two out as a, a bridge between nobody there available to help the guys inside and maybe eventually the three or four or five, even, I don't know what everybody's, you know, prime root team numbers are, but once you get that established, at least you have your team and you should have some experience and some training done and stuff like that. Well, and, and again, as we get to the rest of our panel <clears throat> and I think we've all seen it or maybe even suffered it. I know I did, uh, Bobby, he, he, we, he did an article for you in the class, John Wright from Flower Mound has made a, that when I turned around, and I had nobody there because of a dispatching error. They actually sent all the second alarm companies back to fill in. So you had double companies. Scott and Terry remember that fire. Um, that that the pit you have in your stomach when you have no help there. You have two guys on fire, and I actually got made it up there. You know, to the second here, one of them hollering as he recalled. He said the bees were stinging him. You know, as he's burning, and and it's a it's an empty feeling when you don't have enough help there. And and I want to throw this to to Terry because I know how Louisville is. I know how the county is in that, but you know, something that I've heard Bobby say a thousand times and I'm not exaggerating and, and John about when you're at the fire, it isn't time then to think about bringing more people and determining who your resources are. That stuff should be done way ahead of time. Should be in your, if you don't have CAD, have a damn notebook at dispatch, have, have something easy for them. When you start striking extra alarms instead of like, John says the takeout menu, I'll have three of these and four of those and two of those, and it changes from fire to fire. Terry, you guys have always ran 
with a bunch of people. I remember when I first got there, we added an engine to one alarm just to get another crew there to address that stuff. Yeah, and it's been an interesting transition, to be honest with you, Chief, because uh, even from the time that you've left to now, so we've added uh, an additional truck company to the city. Uh, we've opened another station. So we are getting to the point where, uh, you know, jump way back when you first came here, we really started utilizing uh, our mutual aid or automatic aid partners, uh, and, and, and rightfully so, because we had enough people to put on the fire ground to make that bread and butter, you know, the, the, uh, a room and content fire. But what we didn't have was enough resources readily available to transition to that, Oh crap moment when something goes wrong, the John Wright. So in our particular case, you know, and, and, and people have to get this out of their mindset that because I'm calling another city to send us an engine, well, we could fight our fire. You know, we gotta, we gotta stop with all that we are surrounded by communities here and, and directly touching Louisville. We are the largest or have the most resources at, at the ready, assuming that they're all not, uh, you know, obligated to other calls or other, other situations, but the, the, the having the resources and then also understanding your particular situation, this isn't FDNY or the city of Dallas, where when I say, Hey, send me another engine, send me another alarm, whatever the case may be, it's going to happen quickly. When I say, when, when we make a determination in Louisville, we're going to go to another alarm or I need additional resources, it's going to take a while. There's, a, there's a, in, in essence, a, a 911 call to another 911 center, and we're going to start the whole process of, hey, we need an engine, we need a truck, this is the address. Or What's the, how do you spell that? It takes time. Everyone who, who's been part of this process knows it takes time. So you have preached this from day one, Chief, and, and if, if anyone doesn't ever take anything away from, from what you try to instill in people is be ready for that next thing. Be ready for the next alarm. Be ready for the mayday be re- because you don't have time to make that decision when it happens. You have to make the decision before it happens, and hopefully it never does. And, and I think uh, we have done a good job of accepting that and, and, and in, in the way that translates into how we operate on a day to day is that I think we are poised and prepared to react to the situation when it happens. Well, and, and, and Scott, hang on for one sec, because I got one I want to throw to you, but I just thought of something with Bobby. Bobby, you and I stood shoulder to shoulder as chiefs at a couple of fires, more than a couple of fires um, in Texas. But, you know, all the years you were at Albuquerque. OK, and I always I always tell people, people sometimes forget about Albuquerque. And I mean it because they're not a, they're not on the West Coast, on the East Coast, but they're a, they're a large metro department that's done some pretty freaking incredible things. There's there's studies, there's things that have come out of Albuquerque that people are using that don't know it came out of Albuquerque. Forget the the 40 hour you know, shifts and stuff like that. I'm talking tactics, and strategy and all, hell, all the things you and Ted Nee used to do. But, Bobby, all the years you're in Albuquerque. I know you're a big believer, a big proponent, and just bringing enough people, you know, to the scene that, you know, from, from out now, you travel all over and you get to see this better than anybody else outside the fishbowl, if you will. What do you, what, how are some of the fire departments out there that don't have the Albuquerque resources? We've talked about the Dallas, the FDNY stuff. How are they, you know, what, what are their concerns and how are they making it happen when it comes to having enough people there? when there's one station and there's one and one and they're, they're trying to get everybody there. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's a great question. And I think when we create something like a standard, which is what we're talking about with two in, two out, we have to remember that the authority having jurisdiction has to decide whether or not that standard's applicable or, or, or possible within their boundaries, right? And so in, in a municipality, FDNY, Louisville, you know, Flower Mound, um, you know, Tulsa, places like that, obviously you can do it. When you get out, especially in New Mexico, when you get out to some of the reservations and some of the ranching communities where, you know, we had the King Ranch area and, and you may have some of these spreads that quite literally go for, you know, hundreds of miles where maybe 10 families live. And so although they have a volunteer fire department, the odds of them having you know, sufficient resources to do what they need to do based upon 
the context at the moment, right? In other words, we always look at something in, in after it happened in hindsight bias and, and, and look at what preceded it and then, and then overlay our worldview on that. But we have to understand that the men and women who arrived at that time only know what they know to be true in that moment, right? And so if they're trying to affect rescue in particular, which is always the exception, right? Known rescue to the two in, two out. Um, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta value that, right? You have to understand that these are good people who made that decision in good faith with, with all, with, albeit with the underlying assumption that they were going to survive that attempt and hopefully save someone else because there's no other reason to do it, right? It's a you don't, you don't do search and rescue on a well-involved structure if you don't think there's a person in there. I mean, you just don't do it. It's if you're understaffed, to, in order to have yourself rescued, you, you'd wait, right, for that backup line or that backup crew. So it, it's, a, it's a tough nut to lay a, a one. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Right. Very few things are. Um, you know, uh, very few things in life other than, you know, you know, very, very, very few things in life other than maybe outside the Ten Commandments, and, and even then, most of us on this panel have fudged all of those. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But I mean, very few things in life are absolutes, except for maybe you know things to do with morality and 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 principle, but um, and honor. Never say never. Never say always. Right. Exactly. Except in cases of honor and principle, you know, there's a grade almost everything. And, 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 and the same has it with two and two out. And, and so, you know, uh, and, I, and I always, I always, I always default to what the boots on the ground thought was the right thing to do at the time, because they're the people with real skin in the game. You know what I mean? It's really easy for some omnipotent wizard like myself to roll up, you know, an hour later or watch a video and, and, and say, oh, I would have done this or I would have done that. Yeah, okay. Good for you. You know the ending. These these people are like, holy cow, they're in the moment, you know, and 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 so I we we were very fortunate in Albuquerque. We had wonderfully talented people. We were, you know, sometimes you're a product great really, fire department. Great fire department, great environment for, you know, and, and the thing about Albuquerque is is that it, it extends itself out to all its neighboring communities and all its neighboring communities support it. So, you know, you might be rolling out with the guys from Los, and gals from Las Lunas and Placidas, you know, who are predominantly combination fire departments and, and wonderful people, and incredible firefighters. And, and they would teach you how to do stuff. And then they would roll into our town and we would show them how to do stuff. And, and it was just a really open and, 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 uh, and, and sharing and inclusive, uh, you know, uh, group of folks. So just a really great, great place to learn because, you know, we were really good with those little red plugs on the side of the road. We were not so good when we had to draft. And, and we were the first ones to admit it. You know what I mean? And, and the guys and gals who did it all the time were like, we got your six. You know what I mean? When you get here, we'll take care of the water. You advance the lines. And so, and, and then, and then we, and vice versa. But I'll tell you, we, we, uh, we were blessed and, and John, John and, and I got to hang out because, uh, you know, Albuquerque was kind enough to let me do a, a lot of work with the FDNY when the R and, with the R&D under, under uh, you know, Pete. Pete let me come up and play and I would always get to visit with John and companies up there and we'd bring back what we learned from the FDNY and, and not all of it worked, you know, like we, we didn't believe that, you know, you should segregate, segregate your, your Ita only Italian guys could work in one house, only Irish guys. Could work. We didn't buy into any of that. Other than that, we were good. Yeah. Well, and, and it just, and, and John has said this a bunch of times, Scott, uh, Terry and I had a great conversation last night. I know he talked to you about it, but um, I know everybody in this panel has different agencies reach out to you and say, hey, can I get a copy of this? Can I get a copy of that? All this stuff. And I think that the point that, that I know Bobby just made uh, it, when he started things off with this was, was a great point. That's what made me think about this very conversation I had with Terry and with John is Scott, you've said this before, not every policy or SOG can just, you know, I, I've said they're a template. You, if, if we send you everything from Louisville, like Terry does, take it and chop it up and cut it, find like a particular paragraph you need or whatever. But there's very few, I shouldn't say, there's very few that you could just say, 
this is identical, works perfect my department, just like two in, two out, like just Bobby said, you know, every department has to make it work for them, just like they have to make their rip house. So you have to look at your resources. You know, I've said for years, John used to go home from the the Pez dispenser, the Sears Roebuck fire department with all the surplus, you know, he calls for, you know, 107 engines, he'll get, well, they'll say, we can only send you 102 chief, you know I mean? You know, and then he'd go home an hour, you know, and a half and South Bloom and Grove single station volunteer department and turn around and be relying on mutual aid companies coming from other volunteer departments. So Scott, I mean, the, right. I mean, you, you, whatever you send people or whatever they're doing out there, they need to make this work for their department. Just like Bobby said, it's different all over. It's a standard that you have to take, adopt, and adjust, right? Absolutely. Um, and that's why I'm sometimes a little hesitant to sign, send out what we call our fire operations guidelines, because you don't want somebody just to plug it in and then not to be prepared to execute that. Um, yes, you certainly have to look at it. And it also is, you know, I'm kind of calling it on a philosophy. You either have a pessimistic or an optimistic philosophy about survival, okay? And we're seeing more and more of that in the fire service. I have a very pessimistic view and I'd probably stretch the two in to add a little bit because of our building construction, these small, you've been in them, Rick, the Fox and Jacobs home, they're 1300 square foot. If we delay too long, we don't have a chance. So we're going in with the, 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 the optimistic view. It's, I said, optimistic where we got savable lives in there and we're going to, we're going to give it, we're going to punch it right in the mouth early on. We're not going to make excuses to not win there. We're, we're going to find reasons too. And, and if we don't do that, we're going to miss the opportunity. So be, being optimistic. And, and what happens is you get those that are on the other side and, and they're looking for every reason not to initiate a rescue operation or a fire attack. So I think it's really got to kind of start there. And that goes into your policy, your guidelines is, are, are we assuming that we have people that are alive? Or are we assuming that lives have already been lost and we're, we're not going to make the effort. And I think that's where it's got to kind of start. And that's how all our policies are kind of, kind of built in those early minutes. Well, and, 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 you know, we've said this, every one of us loves the whole close the door whole concept we're doing. Now we, we, I mean, most of us, when we put our kids to sleep, we close the door. And I love the pictures, John, you talk about this all the time. Here's look at this, right? John, you said the other day, said, so you see that, look at this picture, this room's gutted, this room's fine. And, you know, and I know there's, uh, sadly, there's different interpretations from different, like, lawyer people out there about two and two out and what, you know, rescue eminent means. And, they'll, they'll, you know, I was at a conference with, you know, a bunch of them, and they're all talking about the interpretation. And these were some people that are pretty well respected that rescue eminent means someone has to tell you they're in there. And I was like, well, it was never intended that way. You pull up, you, you pull up at the Halton House at two in the morning and there's there's a, a tv on behind a curtain on the second floor and his cars in the driveway a prudent officer somebody should be able to, i always thought two and two hours to keep one guy from running into a commercial building at two in the morning by himself when there's nobody else there not leave my kid you know on the second floor in a bedroom and <laughs> and, and john and i want to go to you with this we said we you know used to say we made liars out of firefighters and i'll, I'll talk real quick everybody knows calvin allison Love and adore Calvin Allison, great captain in Louisville. They went on to be a fire chief and his kids are in the fire service. We've had them on and Andy. And I remember going after Cog Scott, we all know what the council governments are. They were all hot to trot about Texas made two and two out of law. And how are your fire departments doing it? And there was a big Metro department there in the Metroplex. Again, I'm, I'm not even referring to Dallas right now. Dallas is a great fire department, great people. I love their guys. This other department would pull up and say, we're out, we got a, a two-story single family dwelling with heavy smoke showing. We're waiting for uh, the second engine for two in, two out. And I'm like, what do you mean you're waiting? There's people. So I'm like, so Calvin, I remember this after, you know, Donna Baron, great boss. She's like, so chief, how are you guys going to address this? I said, well, we'll, we'll make sure we follow everything. And I, it was like the next night, two in the morning, Scott, you remember this one. And John, you heard me say a story. I'm standing there and they knock an engine for it. That's, and they had three guys in the engine and Calvin came out and said, Calvin, I know I'm going to get asked this because we just went to this freaking meeting. When you pull up, what'd you have? He goes, well, chief, there was a guy out here when we pull, I don't know where he went, but he was out here on the sidewalk and we got her saying they're in there. John, I mean, you've talked about this plenty of times. How do you address your chief, your, your volunteer department, all those years, you know, New York city, especially umpteen years in the Bronx, but how do you address you know, that, that, that whole concept, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's really a bigger question than, than that. Um, and, and the problem is, of course, you, you know, I, I roll up with a, 
two engines or two engines in a truck with 15 guys, like the moment the first rig pulls up, I get 15 guys yet. It, it's not even an issue with us, but, but with the rest of the real world that has two or three guys, like my son's department, North Charleston, right? It, it's a different story, which brings me to one of the points that I make. And, and I, and I hope we can bring up, I mean, we don't all have to be cheerleaders for two and two out. And, and I've made it clear over the years that, that I'm not a big fan of two and two out. And I, and I think two and two out has some, has some drawbacks on it too. And I've always said, you pull up somewhere and you have four geared up firefighters ready to go in. And a guy standing at the pump panel and a chief's just rolling in. Man, you can knock the crap out of just about any house fire, any bedroom fire, anywhere. You can even get a, a team of two people in on a line and you can get a two person team in there making a search. You can really get a good, a good operation going. But if you can observe two in, two out, now you're going to send two people in. Two are going to be standing outside. And I really wonder sometimes by the time the next two people get there, you know, how much more dangerous that situation might be for them to go in. And that's us. Or how much longer have people that are laying in a hallway or the first bedroom on the left side of the hallway, how long are they there waiting for the second engine to get there with the, with the next two guys to be the, you know, the, the two in. So I love RIT. I think RIT is, is one of the most valid, important concepts in the world that a structural fire. And the faster we get a RIT team together or to respond or automatically in from somewhere else, or however you do that, that's a big discussion as well. But I think the two in, two out is like, is like a big brick in front of the front door. You know, I, I, think, I think it really slows us down. I really don't see the benefit of two in, two out. I mean, I understand it book-wise. If you read a chapter, it makes perfect sense, two in, two out. Keep two guys outside in case two guys inside get in trouble. But, man, I'd still rather have four guys inside initially. Knock that fire down in the first two minutes rather than in the first six minutes. And, you know, I mean, you're always giving something up. If there's nobody outside to help them, then the four guys inside are on their own. It worked good for like 300 years so far is what I'm saying. And I don't know. I don't know how anybody else feels about that. Well, let me throw this hand grenade out there. How do you guys feel about, and I already mentioned it, you know, I always thought it was up to a good prudent officer riding the front seat or whatever. Let me throw this hand grenade out there. I mean, should we be able to rely on the first driving officer to make that determination that this is, we're going, we're not going, we're, we're going to hit it, you know, with some big lines to slow it down, get in there because I'm not into this whole, first of all, for years, we've been saying people don't do size ups, right? It's fully involved. No, there's, there's heavy fire out the front, the whole back, the whole half of the other house isn't burning. And if we're going to believe this close the door thing, which I like, there, there's probably somebody in there, some kid we lied to during fire prevention once saying there's smoke, don't go outside because the fire is coming to get you getting in there. You know, if we really believe in the first five minutes dictate, dictates the, ne- the next five hours, then shouldn't we do everything in our in our means to, to, to slow it down or kick its ass or whatever? And the whole, if, if there's two, if you have so much on the outside, and I can't remember how many times I pulled up and said, guys, engine three when you get here, slow it down. We've all done that. There's nothing new with slowing something down and hitting it. And, you know, you watch Uniondale, New York, uh, guys. You've all seen these videos. Union long. John Norman uses tape forever. I've got the tape with the fatality with the kids and all that stuff. You remember it? It's a uh, Cape Cod with the doghouse dormers in the front, heavy fire. The grandpa got mad at the, or the dad, grandpa got mad at the, the daughter and started the back porch, if you will, addition on fire. All right. So now the kids are trapped upstairs, the first line. Anyway, long story short, one line bursts. They got thermal pane windows, which was new. This is the one where you see the actual whole frame melt and the window push out, you know. But if you're around the back, if you watch the whole video at the very beginning of it, there's one one firefighter on a line, and you got crews going through the front trying to get up the stairs to get to the, to the kids. And you've got the ass in his thing is ripping, and he with, with his fog nozzle dialed to a straight stream, He's hitting the fire, but he's not driving water all the way back in and steam. He's hitting, doing darkening and knocking and getting. So we've always been able to do that with smart tactics and all that. But throw this to the panel. Shouldn't good officers be, should be, shouldn't they be able to make that decision? I mean, Terry, Scott, I mean. But this is, and, and I, I, I'm just throwing the, uh, I'm, I'm throwing the, the, the pitch down the plate here to Scott because he talks a lot about this in his book. And I think he's dead on. And that is, there is a a set of expectations that the chief of the department, so in the colony, Texas, uh, and, and, and Scott, you correct me if I'm wrong, but Scott makes it abundantly clear to all of his officers. These are my expectations. This is how we operate. We're going to train for it. We're going to prepare for it. We're going to operate within our capabilities. We're going to do it safely. We're going to do it tactically. 
and, and we're going to be smart about what we do. But I place a very high regard in your capabilities and your ability to size something up and make the appropriate decision on how we're going to proceed. Is that? No, that, that's exactly right, Terry. And this will open another huge can of worms because I hear this all the time. But, you know, <laughs> we're a small department and we made the transition to do kind of what Louisville did. Our truck guys ride the trucks and our engine guys ride the engines. OK, so we don't make a ton of fires, but. Every fire that we do make, we want kind of the, the people doing the same thing so that they build experience and they can try things on the next one. <clears throat> I worked in a system for many years where one day I'm riding the ambulance, one day I'm riding a truck, one day I'm riding a squad, one day I'm riding the engine. And you roll up and you're like, what am I doing? And, okay, you're going to the roof. Well, I haven't been to the roof in five years. Well, you should be able to do that. So, so it kind of starts there. But if we understand our capabilities and we train and we have standards on the fire ground, what we want to address, of course, you, you can't always do them. Sometimes you got to call an audible, but, but we use that word address. The first engine has to address this. The second engine, the third engine, the truck has to address this. And those officers need to get it done. And if they don't get it done, somebody's going to get hurt. But they ride those. They got experience with it. They trained out. And I got all the confidence in the world that they're going to give it its best shot. So so absolutely. And in the absence of that, I think we really leave ourselves open. Well, first of all, we're, we're betting on luck. Uh, but yeah. you're right. That first in officer has a tough, tough, tough job. One of the most difficult jobs in the fire service, but they've accepted that position. Now it's our job to prepare them for that. We train them, we, we, we put them through an assessment, whatever we do to get them there. And then we support them so that they're comfortable going, as you know, we had that Mayday, Mayday last year, a new officer, he handled it, he handled it great. So absolutely, I think that officer, that's, that's the biggest part of his or her job is to decide, number one, do we go in or do we stay out? Number two, if we do go in, how long do we stay in? And, and if, if we can get that pretty accurate, I think we're gonna be, we're gonna be ahead of the game. And it's a great point. And, and John, I was sitting next to you at FDIC when, when Tom Brennan was up there with Bruno, with the Bruno Brennan Unplugged way back when. And I remember when this came up and, you know, he said, rit, rat, whatever they call it. And everybody laughed. You remember, John? And then he said, two and two, he goes, I understand. He goes, it, it's, it's, it's about being smart enough to figure out how many people you need and getting them coming. And we've said, what? You can always turn them what? You can always turn them around, right, John? Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's funny in these days and, and these days have been going on for a long time now, these more modern days. And uh, you, you know, you and I got our old school that we talk about all the time and, you know, people call us that, but uh, you know, I'll see all these certifications and, and, and executive fire officer and, and all these officer certification, you and I are big on officer training. Officer training is, is, is vital. So we, we get, we, we're, we're loading all this stuff on these guys, all this knowledge, all this experience, all this ideas, all this size up. And then we make these mandates that, that they don't, that what they think doesn't matter. They have to pull up and do something at the scene and, and what they think and what they know. I've always said that, you know, an engine pulls up two o'clock in the morning on a residential street to a one family house. And like you said before, a car in a driveway, an American flag off the front post, the front porch light is on. There are people in there and I know it and you know it. I don't need some two in, two out guy to tell me in a book you know, what conditions, some, some drunk doesn't have to come walking along the, the sidewalk to tell me somebody's in there. I got 30 years on a job. We're going, we're going in for the rescue. That's an occupied house. And that should have been built into the system. We're so smart. We have all these levels of, of, of knowledge and training available in the fire service. And then, and then we put something out like two and two out. That's like two pages and that's it. That's what you got to do. And they leave us no, they leave us no flexibility at all with all the experience and training that folks have riding the front seat which would I think make us more effective and, and more and provide a much better service to the folks that are possibly inside waiting for us. And it's that, it's that, it's that good standard in a way that has the Pacific ocean of mud surrounding it of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, like every one of us has said, bring enough people, have enough, have it built in your system. You know, so many good bosses can, you know, the first engines in are doing it. They put up a three, you know, we haven't talked staffing yet. They come in three, they get the pump operator, the two are in there, you know, they're stretching a line. You got two guys pulling up. They're, 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 the other things are going on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's so many other things you could be doing from outside vent to get the second line ready that if you time it right, if you have people coming, sometimes you can send those waves in where you're never really without a couple of people outside. 
But let me throw this, and we've talked about this, to say that a chief that's wearing a turnout coat but no pants, no air pack, and uh, uh, yeah, Scott, you're already smiling. You know, I'm going with this. To, you know, it, that's why we, when, when Terry and I kind of wrote this about, and, and Terry brought it up so, so delicately, I can't repeat it uh, on the air here about, I'll say it nicely, are you just checking the boxes? Because we're just, well, how many people we sent here? Well, my two out is, see that guy down there? Um, he's over there taking blood pressures and put his gears on the rig still. And this, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how good is two out if they're not, if and we've said it before, they're not laying in there next to pallets and straw. You know, we know the majority of the maydays, if you look at the mayday, the majority lasts two to seven minutes. There's still it lasts longer. We end up, but you know, when you look at all of them from do your own research, folks, time it did, you know, time the mayday was called time. It was, it was, you know, secured. We don't have a whole lot of time. Run back, put your gear on, put your air pack on, get your tools, run back. Oh, yeah. Terry, you and Scott are the two. Out. Well, right. And I, Scott, I'll go to you. You were smiling. Just putting people in the boxes. Oh, Bob, oh Bob, okay. Throw it to Bobby. I guess that's the, the thing that I think a lot of people do out of necessity is, well, I have to count those two people so I don't get in trouble with those at City Hall, you know, or the OSHA police don't attack me versus are they actually really available if I have two inside, I get in trouble. Bobby, go ahead, Mike. Okay, because I get to be the ombudsman and because it's my job. And, 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 and I do this at peril of entering Dante's third circle of hell, but I'm going to agree with John Salka. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, so, yeah, I, had, I had coffee come out my nose. Did it actually yeah, come out my nose on, on the air? <laughs> I know. And it's recorded, so I yeah I just yeah, you're, every, best of, now, you're best of friends, folks. Every now and then you get right up to the cliff and you just decide to jump. So it's one of those days. So it's interesting. So one of the things I want to do really quickly is let's put this in some context as to what we're talking about too. Let's go back in time because we were all there. Well, Terry was a little younger, but the, the rest of us fossils were actually there when, when this standard was being debated. And, and Real um, quick, Terry's the Dick Clark of the fire service, so he never ages. So I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, buddy. And you just showed your age by referencing Dick Clark. <laughs> half, half our audience is going enough. Hey. I'm just I glad you finished with it the with top Clark. 20. Hey, here's I, the I did this with my oh, I did this with my iPhone today. That I hung it up like this. So American Bandstand has been off for about 40 years, bro. <laughs> so, okay, when this standard, and look, but, but I, it's important, when the standard was created, there was a certain environment, it was, and, and there, was, there was intentions, and there was things that were being done, and, and one of the guys behind it was our dear friend Alan, who was brought up earlier, and when Alan was on that stage with, with that Tommy that day, I was sitting in the middle of that little discussion, and Alan said, well, we have two and two out because firefighters' lives are worth it. Okay, great. But there was a whole lot going on when that was created. And the other thing Alan said, which I think was kind of prophetic, and he said this actually 20 years before that in 67, he said, anything that we've been doing for 20 years is probably indication that we ought to be, that it's probably either outdated or needs to be looked at again. So we've been doing two and two out now for well over 20 years. And, it, and to John's point, you know, it has made a liar out of a lot of our officers. Cause I used to pull up, my guys would be inside an abandoned building. They'd say, swear to God, chief, when we showed up, there was three guys in a, in a pink Cadillac with Utah plates pointing at the window on the second floor saying, there's a person in there, there's a person in there. Then they sped off. So, you know, because the crews felt compelled to get in there and then, and, and, and for whatever reason. So to Terry's point, I, I agree. If, if we're going to train our people well and we're going to, and we're going to say we trust them, let's trust them. Let, let's let the officer call the ball. And, and maybe it's time for two and two out, which was created with all of the best intentions to be reviewed at the national level. Maybe it could be revised in another way. Maybe it could be, you know, contexted more appropriately. Maybe it could be some good wordsmiths, but so, so I'm, I'm good with that. And then, and then great discussion about this decision-making in context again, and then also the crew integrity and to Scott's point, um, I've all, I, I was sitting at the national fire Academy one time when a, when a chief said, and I rotate my people every day. So one day they're on an engine, the next day they're on this. And I'm like, no, there's a lot of good reasons not to do that. First crew integrity, knowing who you're working with is a big deal. It's a really big deal. And, and if you're, going someplace else every day, that's a problem. You know, like, like there's certain things I'm good at and certain things I suck at. Like you don't want me tying the knots on a rope rescue. Seriously, I'm not the guy. I, I, I've got like rope dyslexia or something. I suck. 
but you do want me in the buggy, you know, calling the ball on, on fire behavior and, and command. I'm okay with that. The other thing too, is that I think as we have this discussion today, we should probably pause for a moment. And, and I think this is appropriate time to do it and, and offer a short prayer and a little reflection in all of our hearts right now for a young kid named Dustin Short from Granite Shoals, Texas, who was off duty, ran into a fire, uh, he's in the hospital fighting for his life right now. He's got lung burns, but he pulled somebody out before, before anybody got there. He's an off-duty firefighter. Okay, so there was no two out there for him. There was no line. He wasn't in his gear, but he put somebody else's life ahead of his own. And so I'm not throwing... I, 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 I would never second guess that kid in a million years. And, and, and I'm praying hard for him. I hope he gets a full recovery. Um, he's got some difficult time ahead of him, according to the stuff I've read. Um, but hey, when people dial 911, they expect brave and heroic people who understand that this job involves a significant amount of risk and this whole theory of safety first always, you know, that's not true. Okay. It's safety third. Your personal safety is dependent on you. Mike Rowe says it best in, a, in that little video. God bless him for it. And, and John's been a huge advocate for this for his entire career. You got to know your limitations and capabilities and context them. And, and you know, if, if you think everything we're going to do is always going to work out, that's not true. It's a dynamically complex, violently dangerous place where we do our job. And, well, and Bobby, you brought something up earlier. You know, you, you you let off by talking about you pull up and there's a vacant building and the guys want to get in there. And you know, right away I'm thinking, I can hear, like I said, you know, to those up on the hill before you start throwing stones down at the village, for every story here what was a vacant structure, you hear two or three where there were people in the building and I you know, had crews that routinely pulled people out of abandoned buildings. Routinely, not it was not the it was not an anomaly when they did it. It was the norm. We had a homeless population that routinely would occupy uh, vacated structures because they had to, because it's all that they could do to keep alive. And and and, and crews that I worked with, brave men and women, went into those structures to get those people out because their lives were just as important as the taxpayers' lives. Just because these people didn't have means or, or these people didn't have capability didn't mean that it wasn't worth every single ounce of our dedication and purpose to go in and try to effect a rescue to get them out. And my crews that, that I worked with routinely did it. It was not the exception. And, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, men and women who had everything to live for, the Gene McPeaks of the world and the Rip Romero's and, 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 and Jimmy Romero's and, and, and just these incredibly talented and decent men and women who, you know, Emily and, and, and the list goes on and on and on that, that, you know, they took risks that were amazing and, and would come out with these people who were trapped, uh, you know, and, and so well, be careful Bobby, about vacant. Bobby, one of your one of your one of your guys and our good friend to all of us, Bill Carey, you know, I, I love so often, you know, he does so much for the Firefighter Nation and other places with I love the data, not drama. I love that. Don't give me your drama. Give me I'd rather give me something I can grab my but he he does a lot of and he did this actually for this 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 class or this class, this session about, you know, and I've seen it before, hashtag expect fire, hashtag expect victims, expect victims. And you said something very important. I want John. John, I, I mean, you talked about it on his show before. You know, the whole we're number one thing, you know, the, like Bobby says, safety first. I, I've said this before. Everybody in this panel, and Bobby, I'll talk about you in particular, are one of the safest people I know when it comes to taking care of your people. And I've said for the longest time, when we talk about number one and us being number one, that's, that's it goes back to what, what everybody in this panel has said already. It's about preparing your people with the best tools, equipment, and gear possible, giving them the training, giving them the apparatus, good sound leadership, good policies, good SLGs, all this stuff. That's you know, we do everything we can to give everything they need to go out and take those risks appropriately and when needed. But John, you've said it, and not to, to, to steal your thunder, John, but I remember you, we were teaching together and you said, look, you know, this whole number one, number two thing, you, you, you did an article. I said, you pull up 
I think you said it best. You said something like, if the, if the mom's outside and she says, right, my 10 year old just ran back in there after our dog, you take your helmet off to mask up. There's a number two in your helmet. And this is, isn't this, John, where the training and all this, you know, I mean, we're not talking you know, about throwing safety to the wind. And it's, and it's funny because just what Bobby was talking about with those vacant buildings where his people were routinely going into vacant buildings and pulling people out because in their area, in their jurisdiction, it got to be the norm that they knew there were people in there. And what you're talking about, whether we're number one, whether we're number two, are we going to go in there and, and, and extremely, extremely expose ourselves? And it comes all back down to the same point we already talked about. It should be up to the company officer. It should be up to the crew. It should be up to the IC that pull up. They're the ones that should be able to decide. I mean, it's not like occupied buildings are okay and vacant buildings are out of bounds. No, there are vacant buildings. I've looked at vacant buildings that I knew were perfectly sound, but they were vacant. They were dilapidated, but they were sound. And I've looked at vacant buildings that I would punch you right in the head if you tried to get in there because you're not going in there <laughs> even if there's people hanging out the third floor window, right? We all know that. We don't know every single building, but we should be trusting our commanders, our company officers, our front seat riders to decide, hey, but it's a vacant building, Lou. Yeah, I know, but I had a fire in here last week. Solid as a rock. Let's get in there, you know, versus the one that's half fallen down in the back and stuff like that. So a lot of these things, it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back to what? To the company officer to the commander, to the incident commander, to the first arriving officer. It's, it's coming down to the people that are calling the shots. And we, and we talk about it all the time, but then we limit them. Then we put all these, all these, you know, roadblocks up in front of them from what they can do and what they can't do. And, and, and like Bobby said, in his place, they were pulling people out routinely out of vacant buildings. So that became the norm and that's fine. But if a guy gets hurt, seriously, at the 29th fire doing it, Somebody somewhere with a bookmark and bifocal glasses is going to say, well, he broke some kind of rule somewhere. He went to a vacant building. And it just is not right. It's just not right. Well, well I, you're right, Bobby. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Bobby, yeah, just coming to us from Twitter from a fellow named Bill Carey. Never heard of him. He, <laughs> and I don't know what IMO means, in my opinion. Two in, two out is now a pacifier for fire service organizations that took the company officer away from his crew without concern to local specifics tied him or her to command must-dos and ignored problems that we could say existed before the fire. Well said, Bill. Well, and isn't it like, and we've said this on this show, Terry, you and I have said it umpteen times. We love to, every one of us loves the fire service. Our families come first, but oh my, holy God, we love the fire service and the men and women that serve, you know, and do what they do. But like, like clean cabs, like RIT, like everything, like, High-rise packs, like writ bags that, when I first did the article, Bobby, for you back in the 90s, on the writ, the very was first writ bag, there was never an intention to take sledgehammers and anvils, which is a really old big chunk of metal for some young guys, watch Bugs Bunny, another old cartoon. We never intended for three people have to drag the bag down the street. And, and, and it's like changing channels in a mayday where not a good idea. But anyway, that being said, good men and women in the fire service don't come up to Chief Thompson, I go, Chief, I got a great idea on how I could screw up the fire ground. I got a great idea how I could screw up our highway. It's good intentions, good heart and good intentions. It, it's like we, we've always done this. Terry, how many times have we talk about? We do this full circle. I've said it before. We're not talking about it, but I've said we're two great ideas away from figuring out this whole clean cab thing. We went so far out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and now we're trying to row our way back to land. It, it, it's it's kind of like I said, two in, two out, good concept. Good thought. Let's get uh, my it, it kind of. You could take two into out and draw a line through. It. Just put my favorite saying: "Think big." I used to hang it up all the. Just think big. Enough people to get there. If you're two hours away, an hour away, whatever, you've got to adjust. And, and Terry, you said it so awesome yesterday. You got to make it work for your people. Everybody's been saying this. You know, train your people. Give them the tools. Give them the equipment. If you don't have, so, I'll just say, if you don't have something in place to get mutual aid, let alone automatic aid come. I don't care how far they are from you. you There's know, and, bigger and, and, issues than whether you're following two and throughout with your whole leadership skills. Go ahead, T. In, in, in Texas, Chief, we're required to submit a, a risk assessment and an analysis to the state, and that is to qualify the, the protective clothing that we're wearing. And, and I don't know. In a nutshell, it's just basically saying that what we chose to wear for our work environment it, it matches what our risk level is. And, it, and, and so, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but I'm just trying to be, be simple here. And so to me, the, the two in, two out thing is, I would like to see a department 
and, and if you need to prepare that in a, in a statement or a, a, a card, a, a sign to put on the wall or whatever, but it's a, it's a, it's a risk analysis for your department. And, and this is how we're going to operate, you know, and if that risk analysis, and, and it's much like what we have in our training room chief, and, and we've posted all over the place is that this is what we're going to risk our lives for. And this is not what we're going to risk our lives for. But to me, it's, it, it really speaks to what your organization, what your capabilities are, what your training is, and, and the amount of, of responsibility that, that you have in, in, in the decision maker's hands, the company officer's hands. This is what we're going to do. And everyone in the organization needs to understand that. If I sit here and just say, well, two in and two out, and I don't want to run into a situation where a guy goes, well, I'm waiting for someone else to get here because by this standard, we have to have two people standing out here before I can send two people in there. But uh, it, and so to me, I, I think it really speaks to to a, a, a total mindset or a, a concept, if you will. And and and, uh, and and like we talked about a little bit earlier, is you got to position your people to succeed, and and you have to prop those people up, give them the tools, give them the training, give them the and give them the the leeway to go out there and make the competent decisions. And to, to act accordingly. And when they don't fix that, but when they do, then, 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 you know, model that and make sure everyone's on the same track. And, and to me, that's what this is. That's what this is in my head. Well, and every one of us, Scott, I'm going to throw you, every one of us has had these conversations before about if you've got a leader or a boss, that's more concerned about what they're hanging on their wall next in a way of a certification or a piece of paper, which we all know is great stuff. We're not dissing any of that. But if that's that that is your that's and you're not talking shop, you're not doing tactics, you're not making sure your SOGs, SOPs work good. If you're not empowering your company officers to make those decisions, you know, I, and I'll throw it to Scott because I was gonna ask John this too. I know how you feel, Scott. It's how I felt. I've never, ever, 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 as John would say, did I say ever? I've never ever questioned why. All right, a captain or somebody went to a second alarm when they didn't need it. I've never went up and said, "Are you kidding me?" What? What? The, I've never, I've never said, hey, "What were you thinking?" Good. All right, good. I'd rather they go along. <clears throat> they walk up, you know, and and John, you've done it. You got the whole street littered with firefighters. You've turned around. You've your hands up. Wait, 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 guys. We got it. We're cutting everybody loose. You know, I'd rather have people there than not. I, I said I've never questioned anybody go along when they didn't need it, but I have had some pretty good loud conversations with people said, I remember a battalion chief said, I thought we could hold it, you know, in this unit on this apartment building, the third floor. And then that breezeway, I said, you were supposed to hold it, Mike, to that apartment building. We have two apartment buildings on fire now. You know, you were supposed to hold it to that. Why did you not bang out a set? I drove all the way here from a chief's meeting across the Metroplex and you never went to a second alarm. And it's the ego and it's the pride. I mean, like Terry, you said, stop, stop, you just... Drop the who doesn't want to go? If you don't want to go to a fire, get the hell out of here. And 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 Scott, I mean, you you I know you run a very safe, aggressive campaign when it comes to fighting fires in the county. Yeah, and as long as Louisville keeps building fire stations out here, we're, we're gonna be in great shape because <laughs> but I think we can we can learn a lot from our brothers in blue and, and the community or the uh, community's response to active shooters. Um, and we learned from that. And, and, and the community finally said what they expect from their police officers. And the Denton County Sheriff here put something out to his organization. I teach it in my class saying, you know, in an active shooter situation, we're not going to wait for another agency. We're not going to hide behind a pillar. We're going to go confront the shooter and solve the problem. Now, imagine if you put something like that out in the fire service, how many heads would explode? Although you should have something, something similar. But the, the, the other problem I have is when you don't have standards, <clears throat> and I call it conditional survivability. What happens when the old lady that lives on the north side of town that's in Truck 5's district talks to her sister in Truck 1's district and finds out that they're getting two different levels of service because Truck 1 trains and has standards and believes in search and getting in and doing the things, been in her search, and Truck 5 is you know sitting down watching a fishing show and all the reasons why we can't go in. What happens when that comes out in our community that your survivability is based on, that's in the absence of standards. If you have yeah. standards, you take care of that. But if we just leave it solely up operationally and don't have those, those things in place to say, this is the minimum level 
that we're going to perform at, whether it's truck five or engine one in the colony, not, not outside in, in Louisville, um, that's a huge concern of mine. And, and we're not far away from that because our citizens are starting to dictate to us greater than they ever have what they expect from their fire, police, and paramedics. Well, and John, and, and guys, we got like five minutes, so we're going to kind of go around here. And Scott has a great, great point. And I, I, I love that. That's why I went to you with that, because that makes all the sense in the world. Because otherwise, we're like a bu- bunch of ducks wandering around a thunderstorm. Hope it happens. Happens for the right reasons. John, you, you were at a class once. And, and I, I, you helped me with the quote you said, the statement you said. It had to do with two and two out and not getting in or not being aggressive. And you said, if my kids are trapped in that home, I want uh, two of the craziest, uh, nut, yes, whatever. Right. I forget how you said it. And if you don't, you said, get the hell out of here or something like that. Right. I mean, but isn't it the truth? I mean, we can't take every issue that we talk and, and turn it personal because we would all throw the books out and do whatever we had to do to save our own families. So, that, so that's a nice conversation, but making it a personal thing sometimes sort of, you know, takes it out of the, out of the realm of reality. But, but on what Scott just said on expectations, I just read a great thing on, uh, I think it was on Facebook this week, about expectations. It was actually a lawsuit. There was some testimony, and there was a lawyer uh, questioning somebody, and it was about expectations. What, what our citizenry, what our, what, our, what our citizens are expecting from us. And it was about a search team, the fact that some kid died somewhere, even though somebody at the scene was saying, hey, my son is in a second-floor bedroom. That window right there. Somebody put a ladder up or something and they never did and they never went in and they never did a search and they never even put a ladder to the window. The kid was found there, not that day, the next day. So it was a a gigantic, terrible public relations situation. But the point was the fire department was there and never really moved on. And and I've said that and we've all been to places where somebody said, nope, she's in there. My mother, she's 89 years old. She hasn't left the house in three years. If you haven't found her, then you haven't found you haven't looked everywhere yet, you know. But, but the whole point is expectations, whether it's fast response, whether it's getting a hose line in there, whether they expect the search team to go in there with or ahead of the hose line, or, or all the other variations that we have. That, that's a rising thing in America right now. We used to be in charge of the fire scene, and now there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of reading and going online and finding out what the SOPs are for the, for the local Oxfordville fire department. And guess what? They're, they're holding our feet to the fire now sometimes versus it's just not like, oh, here comes the fire department. You know, people still love us. But I think there's greater expectations out there for us to perform now. And I think in a way it's good. And there was a great message in that article. I know I read the same one that, you know what, we've said it a long time ago. People are suing the fire service now. They're not like, oh, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're not, you know, if we don't do what we're supposed to do or deliver what we're supposed to do, they're, they're turning around and officers are getting hung up for different things and so on and so forth, hooked up for it, you know, just, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's a different world and you need to be ready. And again, you know, if you're going to sit back there and and go against everything you said you're there to represent, you're going to end up you're going to end up in trouble. But Bobby, your thoughts as we close things out here, we'll go around the table here. We just hit John. Well, I think the good news is, is that everything gets revised. So there's a revision cycle. So if you're interested in this topic, get involved. You know, let's 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 revise this uh standard. Let's, let's get language that's more appropriate to how we really do business, right? And, and remember, everything was done, albeit with the best of intentions. Nobody did this to create problems. It was always done with the best of intentions. But, you know, now we have more information. We've seen it in action for 20 years. Let, let's, 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 take some, let's take some steps. And to John's point, um, expectations are very important. And, and we know that. And so, you know, now I think we have an ability to understand what those expectations are more um, honestly and, and try to live up to them. And, and we need to let people know, you know, what the capabilities are in, in some of our locations. In other words, there, there are places in America where, you know, you're going to get one person on the truck maybe for a while and then someone else is going to show up. But that's a choice you make when you live there and you can, you could pay some incredible property value tax or, you know, mill levy and, and, and try to affect that. But that's, that's, that's local control. And that's a good thing. That, that's a good thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think one size will ever fit all. I don't think we'll ever have a national fire service. I think that would be a huge mistake because you're going to have the disparaged levels of, of service based on geographics. It's just reality. It's objective reality, which I know a lot of people struggle with today, but it's objective reality. 
So um, you know, you can you can wish that you were a magic fairy dancer. You're still Bobby from Tulsa. So um, th that's just the way it is. So to John's point and to everyone else's point, I think we've got a great conversation here to start maybe looking at how do we either eliminate or revise or reword or recontext the whole idea. And, um, and I, think that's a, I think that's a really valuable thing. And I really appreciate everybody being on the, uh, on the call today and allowing me to participate. So thank you, Ricky, and thank you, Terry, for having us all on. And well, it it, it, Bobby, great, I mean, great to speak to Scott and John. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, it is. It's a great point that, you know, look, and the statistics are just that and when it comes to staffing. Not everybody's running with four and five people on their rigs. And, and the, the, the lion's share are the, the majority, if you look at it, do, do, go look it up, are three person staffing. There's a lot of two, like you said, Bobby, there's some ones. This goes back to what John said, you said, Scott said, Terry said, you have to make this work. You have to figure all this out, how you're going to run automatic and mutual aid with your jurisdictions. Otherwise, you know, it's a bag of marbles hitting the, hitting the driveway. Scott, closing thoughts? First of all, it's refreshing. You know, you guys are all my role models and mentors to hear you say the things you are. But, um, you know, I, I say it all the time. We have more information technology available to us and we can be the smartest fire service that's ever existed, but we're still, we still have 3000 plus civilians that are dying each year. Uh, we obviously have a lot of room for um, improvement. And, and I say it all the time, if we want to be funded like professionals and viewed as professionals, and I include volunteers in that, uh, we need to be able to compete with fire problems on a professional level. And that's being the top, there's, there's nobody bigger, badder, better than us. And again, it's, it's situational to where you live and, and geographical, but I think we need to use the data, use the science uh, to fight more fire better and not as justification to get less involved with fire problems. And I'm afraid there's a contingent out there that would like to see us do that. But, but thank you all for your, your thoughts. It was, it was as educational for me as probably anybody. Thank you. Oh, good message there, buddy. Good we, Terry and I just need to have you come on all the time with us. We had, <laughs> I, I said, if Bobby doesn't give you your own damn show, then we just need to have you come on and be on with us all the time. Hey, I'm, team, out, of I'm out of Wednesdays. <laughs> out of Wednesdays. <laughs> we'll give we'll give them that last Wednesday in February once in a while. But anyway, uh, Terry, closing thoughts, buddy. Well, for the record, I think uh, Bobby, I think you agreed with John twice during this show. I'll have to go back and, and <laughs> I but think I, so I, too. Yeah, so, but uh, you know what I, I would say, and and this kind of goes out to the fire service in general, to the to the chief officers, to the battalion chiefs, whatever. Have this conversation. Uh, I think that if if you've got people working in your organization and they don't understand what your expectations are, if they don't understand what what your department's all about. Uh, from the chief officer standpoint, shame on you because they should know. And and but you should have this conversation, and and you should make sure that you don't have people working in your organization that have this cloudy vision of of what they think you want. And and I, I'm not I'm not so sure what we should you know should I hesitate or should I? But this should be a this should be a topic of conversation, and uh, and everyone should walk away from that with a with a better understanding of of what your what you uh, what you expect from from every member of your organization? Perfect, perfect. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, hang in there while we, uh, as Terry and I always ask you to, until we go off the air, we'll chat for a couple of minutes. But, folks, we've had some 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 great guests with us. Well, kind of, they're not even can't even call them guests. They're on here so much. They're our partners and our buddies and everything else. But we've had uh, Chief Bobby Halton. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you don't know who Bobby is you've been sleeping somewhere where you're not out there you you know I can't even I think people that are, are off the grid you know know who Bobby is but uh FDIC and f you know the United Fire Conference and you know uh, over every all our magazines um and, and, and among other things Bobby thank you so much and thanks for the opportunity to give us to, to host this show all the time buddy thank you brother uh Chief John Salka uh, retired FDNY, 33 years in the 18th Battalion in the Bronx, a busy-ass battalion, and currently the chief of South Bloomingdale Fire Department. Thanks, buddy. Scott Thompson, the chief and of the And the author of the Texas. back page on Firehouse. Read it first. <laughs> Read it first. Read it first. Read it first. 
Um, and then, you know, Scott Thompson, the chief of the county, Texas, a very uh, safe but aggressive fire department. If you want to see how to do it, take a ride out to the county and spend the day visiting with them. And then my, my, my partner, uh, I want to say partner in crime because someone will arrest me, but my partner, uh, you know, Chief Terry McGrath from Louisville, Texas, another great fire department. So, guys, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you. You've been on, this is, like I said, a regular thing for this, this particular panel. But hey, to our to our viewers, we're on Facebook and Twitter and the web our website. So all you gotta do is run over and get one of those, and you can you can find us if you want us. Our next show date is August nineteenth. Terry and I host uh, the third Wednesday of every month. Um, you can catch the live ones Wednesdays. You can catch them all the. You can go back in time and listen to all of them if you want. They're all in the archives of just like the radio shows, the podcasts we call them now. All of them are there. You can go back and you can spend years listening to the shows there's some great people sharing some great information just like there is here every wednesday uh in closing and, and I, I i know i know the whole panel was messed up um the whole panel feels the same way um uh, we'd like to ask you to keep please uh keep the men and women serving armed forces in your thoughts and prayers and a shout out to the united states navy oh my god what a great i know bobby and i are part what a great job and they're still working at it with what with what they had out in san diego with that chip fire uh, that's my boys old squadron doing those bambi buckets 1200 bambi bucket drops on that ship military ship fire that was unbelievable unbelievable oh, just huh? what a what a great job my son that was his uh hsc3 baby hsc3 <laughs> But we want to definitely throw a shout out to them. And again, please keep all our men, our men and women in the armed forces your thoughts and prayers. Remember this phrase, please, and, and practice at all time. Never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Be safe. God bless you. And thanks for, for tuning in, folks.